Thanks, and I'll be opening up the panel, but before I open up the panel, I just want to say thank you to Bob for the invitation, um, and thank you to everyone for being here. I think this is an unbelievably important topic, because when we think about what we do at an academic center, it's to create knowledge. And when we create knowledge, it can be in the sciences, it can be in the medical sciences, and if you have a medical center, it can be in care delivery. And we don't just want it trapped in our ecosystem. And we just don't want it trapped for the citizens of New York, but we want to actually impact the world. And so when we create knowledge, we want that knowledge to not only go to the cities around the world, but to the citizens in all parts of the world. And give them the same quality of care that we deliver here, for instance, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which I can tell you is the best in the world, and deliver that care to the folks in my mother country, Peru, in the mountains there, where they don't even have CT scanners and radiation oncology machines, or in Africa, or in the Middle East, or in Asia, or even in remote parts of, of Europe. And so I think that's the absolute goal here. And so I applaud Bob for really taking the lead here in detailing how can we harmonize the delivery of care, but before that, how do we harmonize clinical trials, and even before that, how do we harmonize the detection and monitoring of cancers in ways that are not available even in this country to many of our individuals? So I want to introduce a panel, and this is in no specific order, but I'm going to start with David Fredrickson of uh, AstraZeneca. He's Executive Vice President of Oncology Business. Please come up. And then I'm incredibly happy to introduce Larry Norton, who is a Senior Vice President uh, of the, in the Office of the President at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He's also the Medical Director of the Evelyn Lauder Breast Center and the Norna Safrim Chair of Clinical Oncology. And he also happens to be probably the most un famous oncologist, not only in New York, but possibly in the world. <laughs> and next is Aminu Umar Sadiq, who's CEO of the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority. Welcome. And last but not least, Isabel Mestre, CEO of the City Cancer Challenge. So I'm going to pick on you first, David. Um, in your mind, because you're, you're looking at this from a pharma lens, what do you see the value of regulatory harmonization across countries, not only for clinical trial development, but actually for commercialization of of the drugs that you make that are so important to patients? So, um, Luis, I think that maybe just, and, and as you quite rightly point out, um, as I think about my responsibilities and my accountabilities at AstraZeneca, and I think that your remarks really get to this, um, certainly uh, a, a huge part of what I think about is how do we actually make sure that great science uh, and great outcomes from clinical trials reaches patients across the globe? So my job is really in the delivery of great science. I work together with research and development, obviously, to uh, invest in clinical studies, but then my role is to make sure that we're not just having great publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, but that actually those data, that great medical science is translating at a postal code level in terms of, of having impact. So if I really think very practically about what that means, regulatory harmonization, clinical trial harmonization, is actually one of the best ways of ensuring that we can deliver medicines and great science and breakthroughs across the globe as quickly as possible. Just to make that really factual, and why is that? We hear, on the one hand, that only 5% of patients participate in clinical trials, and that is absolutely a fact. What that also means is that if we want to eliminate cancer as a cause of death, yes, one goal is, is that we need to increase the number of patients in trials, and we must do that. But the other is we got to get together 95% outside of clinical trials. Right? So there's two different ways to come after this. And so regulatory harmonization, if you think about what that really means, that is fundamentally a lot of fancy words to say, how do we get medicines to patients across the globe more quickly? The regulatory lag that exists between the United States and many other parts of the globe is uh, in, I would say, on average, six to 12 months, but in many situations is much, much longer than that. Two years, three years. 
And some of that is obviously uh, areas that sit outside of regulatory harmonization, but I think that regulatory harmonization through things like Orbis that you've heard about have the opportunity to actually make it for simultaneous approvals across the globe of this. And why is that important? It's important because that's good for R&D productivity. That's really important for industry as we think about how we get more effective phase three studies, how we make sure that we're able to actually deploy more resources against more studies to benefit more patients. And I think that it's also really good for patients in societies across the globe. I think the last thing, uh, Luis, that I'd like to just share on this that I think is, is, is really important and maybe to specifically point in on the US-China element. I think the US and China have the opportunity to lead the globe in this cure for cancer, which is not in any way to leave out all of the other important parts of the globe. And as I respectfully have, you know, members here uh, that are that are certainly thinking about, you know, uh, many other parts of the globe. And Isabel, uh, of course, is is within that too. But when you take a look at the number of new drugs in development, the growth that's happening within China is 440 percent over the last uh, several years in terms of the number of medicines that are in early and within late stage clinical studies. You see tremendous growth in the number of new biotech companies that are being founded within China. So in the last decade, you had about 10,000 new biotech companies founded in the US, about 6,000 in China, and 2,000 in Europe. And I sit here today as actually a member of a European company, so not as an American, which I am, but as a member of a European company. And within that context, when you look out there, when we look at where we want to run studies, we're going to go where the patients are and where the science is best. And the patients we've heard are in large part in the US and China in terms of that's where the greatest of the global cancer burden sits. Of course, it's across the globe, but we heard 37, 40% of the patients there. And we know that there's great science sitting within these locations. So it is really, in my view, incumbent upon the US and China to really be focused in on how to together lead a global effort against this. And I can say that AstraZeneca is really committed within our objectives to making sure that one, we're really creating as much opportunity to increase clinical trials in the United States and increase uh, research and development here and to really, really do the exact same within China and in service of the globe. Great, thanks David. Um, so moving from the clinical development research arm to clinical trials all the way to community access. So Isabel, I wanna focus on you here. How does this, this harmonization of the regulatory aspects of not only clinical trial development but other aspects allow us to access communities better? And I'll leave, and I'll leave the, that question with you. Thank you so much. So before I'll give a bit of context of City Cancer Challenge so that people understand. So we are a, a Swiss-based foundation and we come from the Union for International Cancer Control. And the ambition was actually to go to the community to uh, advance access to cancer care. There's so many, um, apologies, so many global conversations happening, but very little action and very little evidence on how to improve health systems to guarantee access to, to quality cancer care. So we've decided to set up an organization that would go to the community level. And because cancer is complex and requires a health system strengthening approach, we thought that cities would be like the minimum viable product to tackle it from a systemic approach. So we're currently in 14 cities. We are in Latin America, we're in Africa, we're in Nigeria recently, we just joined Abuja. We're in Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. And our model is totally locally led. The community is the one that will alert the fact that there is no access to innovation, that there's no access to drugs, because they're the ones that have the evidence on what are the gaps in the daily life, and they have access to the patient, and therefore is where the closest to the data is. So what we are seeing is that, of course, harmonization, the lack of harmonization is bottlenecks for many countries to get access to some of the innovation. It's critical to guarantee quality, it's critical to ensure efficiency and safetyness, but I would also like to challenge that that doesn't guarantee access. I would say guarantees quality, but doesn't guarantee access. Most of the countries we work, they don't have access to basic, basic treatment. And the, all the advances over the last 20 years is, hasn't reached those countries. And 70% of cancer deaths are happening in low-income countries. And that's gonna keep growing as population ages 
it's going to keep growing. And still, innovation is not going there. So I think that what I would like all to explore is how we combine innovation, but at the same time, how do we improve readiness for the health system for that innovation? That is not happening. I was looking now, only 2% on the global research agenda is going to implementation science. So we don't really know. Let me tell you what works in the US in terms of access to medicine doesn't work in many countries. If you think about Kenya, it's $40 per patient per year. With $40, everything that works here is not applicable in that context. So we need to invest a bit more of implementation science, or implementation research to understand what are those interventions in those contexts that are going to allow all this innovation to go to the patient. Because again, we're innovating for the few, but we're not innovating for everyone. Thank you, very good points. And I will say even in this country that has so much, there's limitations in access to care. Um, and some of them are not even financial, some of them are geographic, uh, socioeconomic, uh, cultural. Uh, so your points are very well taken. So we, we've heard from my perspective, which was that of creating knowledge. You've heard the pharma perspective of really taking that last few yards to the goal to get the approval and hopefully access the world. We've heard the, the, the really challenges to getting care, the $40 mark is, is very sobering, of getting care to communities across the world, especially the, mo the most strained communities. But there's a, a component right in between, which is infrastructure. Um, and Larry and Aminu, I'm going to talk, ask you about that because both of you have a lot of experience in not only establishing clinical care and academic centers, but partnering with pharma, partnering with the community, um, and really to, to do remarkable things. Aminu, I'd like to hear about your experience in that, in, in really establishing the largest cancer center in Nigeria, and because that's really a model that many countries can, can follow and, and so thank please. you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Isabel. I think you took the words right out of my mouth. I think equity and uh, um, access is fundamental going side by side with innovation. Um, and I think that's where the Nigeria Sovereign Investment Authority has tried to play in the context of, of Nigeria. Um, to give context, we are Nigeria's Sovereign Wealth Fund. We are at about $5 billion. And by law, we have three ring-fenced funds, one of which is an infrastructure fund. And we decided to prioritize healthcare as one of our focal sectors in the infrastructure um, space, particularly to um, address some of the issues that um, Isabel mentioned, um, which is around equity in terms of access to world-class care. Um, so as NSI, what we decided to do was to focus um, on two areas. The first is around oncology and the second is around medical manufacturing. Um, because on the one hand, um, um, it's, it's fundamental that we offer um, sort of access to care that um, includes the very best equipment, that includes the very best um, clinicians and non-clinicians, that includes the very best patient experience, that includes the very best pricing. Um, and importantly, that is actually um, located within the jurisdictions of the communities um, that require that care. So that's on the one hand. The other hand also is around medical manufacturing. We need to, as much as possible, begin to manufacture these drugs um, at home, um, irrespective of what it costs. Um, so whether it's around API manufacturing, whether it's around excipients manufacturing, and um, further down the line, even vaccine manufacturing, how do we begin to um, innovate around those such that we're able to get the scale, the market, that make it bankable to um, offer propositions within those spaces. Two and a half years ago, um, with the help of um, um, international organizations, the MSKs, the BVGHs, we decided to put forward uh, a cancer proposition co-located within a tertiary institution in Lagos. And um, over the last two and a half years, we've essentially perfected that business model around um, how to capacity build our clinicians and non-clinicians, how, how to access patients, how to essentially how to ensure that the governance around treatments is in place. And um, we are in a position now where we're going from one oncology center to three, um, just so that we can essentially take, we can expand 
um, with that technology, with that innovation to other jurisdictions with the, within the country um, that would also be seeking out um, that care. So from our perspective as investors, um, what we are looking to do is to essentially take um, the technology, the solutions, the passion, the aggregation, and making that um, available um, within frontier economies. Great, thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Larry, from your perspective, how would this harmonization, regulatory harmonization, really help with private public partnerships? We've seen it work here in the United States. How do you expand this globally? It's, it's a big challenge. Um, you want an easy answer to that yeah. one. You know, that's a, uh, I gave you the hardest question. Yeah, um, and I've been listening very carefully to all the superb comments that have been made so far, um, and I'm in, impressed with several things in this regard. Um, uh, you know, we've heard about you know need for regulatory harmonization, um, uh, research harmonization as well, uh, which I've been very involved with for, for many decades in my various roles. Healthcare delivery in places where um, uh, economics is not as advanced as in other parts of parts of the world. Uh, the establishment of centers um, and uh, and the ability to uh, to make advances there, and also the the embedding of businesses within countries, um, so that you actually have. Uh, economic advancement that goes along with these advances, all right, and, um, and, and all the various pieces that we've heard about, and I don't want to repeat them all because we've heard about them. And it reminds me of a very common question when I'm, uh, when I'm speaking to lay audiences, you know, about cancer, and they say, well, Larry, what are you most excited about? Where is the real advance going to come? And I said, I'm going to answer that question, but first you've got to answer this question for me. What is the most important part of an airplane? Is it the left wing or is it the right wing? Is it the landing apparatus? Is it the pilot? Is it the navigation? Is it the communications? The most important part of the airplane is that all the parts have to work and they all have to work together. Uh, and so it's not a one thing. It's, it's, it's a comprehensive uh, approach that is ab absolutely necessary. So, so the real question that it boils down to is um, um, how do you accomplish this? We, we all have the same goal. Everybody in this room has the same goal. How can it be, how can it be accomplished? And, um, and, and I think that with all my decades of experience in doing this type of thing uh, in, my, in my various roles in the government and Memorial Sloan Kettering and other things, um, I, I think I boiled it down to a Zen essence in my own mind, which is it has to start with a demonstration project. It has to start with one thing that's accomplishable, that can be done, uh, and can demonstrate that people can work together and they can accomplish common goals together. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big, this big thing, it can be a very small thing, uh, but it has to be something that, that has a very high likelihood of success and demonstrates that it works. And, and every time that I've been involved in something like that, um, the, the bigger picture grows organically around it. Success leads to another success, another success. And, and at the core of that is passion is that people are, are, are passionate about making a difference to the world. Everybody in the world is passionate about making, uh, making some difference that's going to really help other people, help their families, help their communities, and, and extend it out to the world. And if you can embed that passion in, into people um, with a demonstration project that actually works, that's when, that's when great things happen. So I think that our job today and our job you know, going off into the future is to think of what are the demonstration projects that are accomplishable that we can work together to actually make this work. I think clinical trials is a very good example because we've, we've really, all the advances that I've seen in cancer medicine that you've been involved with, uh, Louise, and all the advances that, that we've been involved with over these years um, are based on clinical studies. And what are clinical studies? Basically, they are, they're an instruction set for how to take care of a patient in such a way that information can be gained that we can answer important scientific questions and therefore we can move the field forward. Um, that's actually a demonstration of what you can actually accomplish. Uh, and, and, and by the way, it, one of the things that we've learned about clinical trials is that when you have a clinical trial that's embedded in a community, not only do the patients on that clinical trial do better, but all the other patients do better because it's basically it's an educational process for, for everybody involved. But also, um, something else that I've learned is that being involved in a clinical trial, whether you're a physician or a scientist or a patient, um, uh, is a passionate activity because you're involved personally in trying to make advances. Uh, and and that, can, that, that, that passion for making advances can then spread to other parts of your life, other parts of the scientific enterprise, and, uh, and really help improve the world. Thanks, Larry. And Larry, what Larry does is make my job easier because you just brought up the next question. 
And this is a question. I, I read your sheet there. Yeah, no, I, it, I'm going off the sheet now. Um, and uh, this is a, a question I'm going to address to the whole panel. We have five minutes before we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. But the, I think the pilot project in clinical trials is outstanding. But what I heard was a slightly different perspectives from every member of the committee. I'd like you to create in your own mind what the best pilot project would be. And I'd like to begin with David. <laughs> the, the, uh, well, I think um, I think as a demonstration project within this, and, and in fact, we are starting to do some work that looks like this. I, I think that within a country, so again, if we want to take a look at what does it look like to end to end deliver equitable care, and I think that what we're getting at and talking about, which I absolutely agree with all the comments and, and most recently from Dr. Norton on this, that it's very difficult to inspect equity in on the back end. You have to build it in from the front end. And so what that means is it's got to start with research. It's got to be a part of development. It's got to be part of the delivery. You talked of the virtues of just of the ecosystem of this. I think also similarly, if we think about from screening to diagnosis, to access to precision medicine, to delivery and access to care, that continuum is also really, really important in terms of making sure that there's no care gaps throughout that continuum, just outside of the clinical trial context. And so I think a demonstration project, and, and we're doing some work like this, but if you go to rural Appalachia, or if we were to go to Southern Louisiana, or we were going to pick another place, you know, in terms of into southern Spain, wherever it might want to be, where you really do work to bring together the multiple people that it's going to take in order to be able to, as Professor Wu talks about, eliminate lung cancer. What would it look like to say, we're going to set a goal here in this community to reduce lung cancer mortality by X? And what we need to do to bring people together to drive screening, drive diagnosis, drive the precision medicine over a period of time to do it. Because I do think that it takes multiple partners coming together in a postal code or a set of postal codes to make that happen. And I think that through things like Moonshot or things like Healthy China 2030, that there's opportunity and interest and revenue and resource to, to create those kinds of demonstration projects that could exist within the broader umbrella. Right, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think in that that will be inspirational to really all academics and all companies and all groups that are interested in developing this. Um, I'm going to go next to you, Amino, because I think your 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 pilot project would be very interesting here. I'd be curious to hear your perspective on this. On data, I think in the context of a frontier economy, I think uh, we would only prioritize data if it is linked to accreditation. So if you do not um, have an extremely well-governed um, data gathering process, it affects your accreditation. And number two, payment for service. Um, if, you, if you link the ability of your institution um, to get funding um, for patients utilizing your center, um, then it also, also enhances um, the incentive for facilities to actually focus on data gathering. So I think um, it needs to start from a well-governed, well-capitalized regulator um, who is able to essentially mandate all um, oncology centers around those two areas. Thank you. And now, Isabel, your, your pilot project. Your, and I want you to think big here. What would be the ideal pilot project? And where? We have a well-defined what the city of tomorrow good looks like. So if I could have the funding to demonstrate how you take a city in low-income countries to that city of tomorrow, that would be my ideal. Actually, the, the biggest gap we're facing it, we know now what good looks like in terms of health system strengthening and quality cancer care. The biggest gap is how to get there. What are the best interventions? We don't know. What are the best interventions to go there? So we just keep trying, trying, trying. Of course, how we reduce time from symptoms to diagnostic, how to reduce time from diagnostic to treatment, how we guarantee that the quality, that the protocols are there used. All of that, it's, it's possible. We are tackling it all, but again, there is, we need funds. 
we are in the ground driving all these conversations, making them happen. And when I say we, it's not SICAN, it's the local stakeholders. We working with 350 health workforce, actually driving, making this change, taking to the city of tomorrow. If I could prove one city, or at least three cities, different contexts, I think we would be able to tell the world what are the best interventions to take cities to a better stage. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we're happy to open it up for questions from the audience. Panelists are happy to take questions. Oh, one more pilot project. Dr. Norton feels that he didn't oh. get a chance to offer yeah, his. Was, yeah, David is shocked. <laughs> David is shocked that thought, you left me out. You, you said I, clinical I, trials. I'll, I'll give you one sentence on this thing. Yeah. I think it's data sharing. I think that's one of the biggest impediments that we have actually in modern modern cancer medicine is the uh, fact is that there's an enormous amount of data all around the world. I have a suspicion, and you know, both said this, I think we already know the answer to cancer. I just don't think we know that we know the answer to cancer. I think that we already have enough scientific information out there and we have enough uh, pub public information out there. Um, and I'm saying this only because that's been the history of science all along, um, is that when major discoveries are made, people look at it and say, gee, you know, we could have come up with that 50 years ago. Um, uh, and just, we didn't put the pieces together. And I think, I think that a demonstration project of actually having international, and just pick two countries if you want, or two regions, uh, true data sharing where it could be put in one place and, and in, a, in a way that other people can examine it. I'm talking about clinical data, I'm talking about delivery data. I am talking about, uh, I'm talking about molecular data. Uh, I'm talking about you know, administrative data. I mean, if we could actually pull together data sharing across regions, I think that we can make truly major advances. Great. I mean, if you think, Luis, for a second about the power of what Larry just said, I mean, he just basically offered, and I've heard this perspective and I believe it, that the science actually exists to be able to defeat this disease in its many forms, and that the challenge is actually how we work together and then the challenge is how do we work together to deliver it? I mean, that's a really powerful, right? I mean, and, and let's say it's not all there. Let's say it's 80% there. Well, that's still an awful lot of the way there. And still we have this stark reality that one in three uh, people are gonna get cancer. So it's clearly there's an impairment. I mean, that means we look left and right and one of us in the three is gonna get it. And it's really quite astounding to think about what he just said, in my opinion. No, I think uh, Larry's always full of great wisdom, and I agree with him. I think that, that a, lot, a lot of the knowledge is there, uh, a lot of work to be done. Um, so questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'm going to go off, go off uh, the paper here and I ask some more questions. Question right here. Um, Jennifer Dent with BioVentures for Global Health. I mean, I've loved this panel and everything that everyone said is just a great start to, um, well, the whole morning has been a great start. But I wanted to turn this back to you, Louise, because I think one of the most powerful um, demonstration projects, and I loved the way Larry spoke about the airplane and just a uh, holistic approach, is um, the study that's based on your foundational research that was presented a year and a half ago at ASCO on the MSI High um, study in colorectal cancer patients and the amazing data that you saw and the fact that you and colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering are actually taking this study to Nigeria. And I know we have Aminu who you know, it has funded and built um, such an amazing center in Nigeria that are going to be probably one of the two centers in Nigeria that will participate in the study. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that project as a demonstration project, because I think everyone... And, and I'll, call, I'll bring in what, what Larry said. When a lot of the, the work I do, after we do it, a lot of people say, oh, that's obvious. And it, it is obvious because the data is sitting right there. Uh, the ideas are sitting right there, and a lot of it's in execution. Um, but the study that we published last, last year, almost going to be two years now, um, was that we took immunotherapy in a patient with a certain mutational marker, and we tried it in patients when they were just diagnosed. Not when they had metastatic disease, but when they had localized disease. It's normally cured by surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And in collaboration with Andrea Sersek, we performed the study, and the tumors melted away. And when the idea is correct, and the science is correct, the result looks like magic, and I think that's true not only for basic science, but clinical science, implementation science. When you do something correctly, it looks like magic. And in these first 18 patients, it looked like magic. And I can tell you we're almost up to 100, and the rectal cancer patients, it's all melting away. So we're going to deploy this trial um, in collaboration with Beijing, who, and this is a regulatory infrastructure issue, 
who was the only one that could help us deploy a drug in Africa. Things like shipping the drug, things like access to the drug in that country were a challenge. And the hope is when we treat these patients with this molecular marker with rectal cancer and colorectal cancer, they will, the tumor will also melt away. I'm confident that it will. But think about what the change here is. Normally the patient would get chemotherapy, radiation, and then surgery. And all of those don't require a general surgeon or a general radiation oncologist or a general medical oncologist. You need an expert. That doesn't exist in most of the world. And so you're going to be able to leapfrog all that technology and just go from diagnosis, detection of the molecular personalized marker, treatment with immunotherapy, and then they're done. And that, that's, that's the goal there. The other interesting tidbit that I can tell you, and uh, Peter Kingham, who I think you're hearing from later today, discovered that for some reason, in Nigeria, individuals with colorectal cancer have, don't have this marker that's only present in about 5% in the United States. It may be as high as 25%. So a quarter of the patients will be impacted. And it brings back a story uh, that I like to tell about my trips to South America. And in about 1994, I'd go to South America and some of the villages my families were at would have one telephone for about 10,000 people. And you'd have to pay by the minute to make a call. And I came back about 12 years later and everyone had a cell phone. And the technology leapfrogs and provides, at least in that example, technological access. And I'm hoping this is that example project that will show how we can leapfrog standard of care and use modern science to not only reduce the implementation costs, but really have a tremendous impact on these patients. So thank you for that. Other questions? Question right there in the middle. Good morning. Hi. Um, great panel. My name is Sarah Yusufzai. I work at MSK, and I promise I did not collude to ask this question with any of the panelists, but I'm asking this question sort of uh, from an intersectional lens as someone born in a low-income country, Bangladesh, somebody who works at MSK, and somebody who was at enterprise technology companies for over 20 years before coming to MSK. So I've been sort of drowning in either organizational data or my client's data for years. And um, to the point about data, as we involve more underrepresented groups in these incredible initiatives, where will the data go? How will it be stored? How will it be governed? How will they have access to their data? How will we tell them? And how can we start to think about normalizing some kind of framework uh, as this other harmonization happens? Thank you. Who, who wants that one? I, I, well, I just say, so uh, I, I, I I am the founding scientific director of something called the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, which is a you know large foundation, international foundation actually now, for breast cancer research. And we've established what we call a data hub in, in University of Pittsburgh, uh, where they have supercomputer capacity, where all of the data that we generate from all Breast Cancer Research Foundation research, including all the molecular data and, and, and all the clinical trial data, is going to be stored. Uh, and, and, and there'll be access to it by all Breast Cancer Research Foundation investigators and eventually, eventually the, the world. We've been working on this for a decade. Uh, as, you, as, you, as you mentioned, there are a lot of hurdles that have to be, that have to be accomplished in this particular regard. But it's a demonstration project, uh, you know, to see what we can really do. And we've already learned a tremendous amount in this regard. Um, uh, you know, it, we're not, frankly, we think we know what cancer is, but I'm not sure we know what cancer is. And I think that the result that, you're get, that you, you've gotten with the, um, with the immunotherapy really you know, illustrates that. I mean, it's, it's inexplicable by our common models of what cancer is that you should get that kind of result, basically. And what does it really mean biologically um, so that we can actually generalize it? Um, uh, and actually looking at very large data sets and the influence of therapy on, on, on outcomes in large data sets, we're getting hints of what, what is really making cancer cancerous that we wouldn't have gotten if we were just looking at individual trials, uh, that you have to look comprehensively and you have to say, well, it's true in this data set, is it true in this data set, and move it, move it around. So that, so that that was an example of a demonstration project. And you can imagine what would happen if we were just, this is just the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, if we could actually go national with it, uh, if we can go internationally with it. Uh, we have, the, we have the technical capabilities of doing this, um, uh, of bringing this all together. You look at weather prediction, for example, which is an international activity. You know, where is the hurricane going to hit? That's an international activity. Um, we, you know, uh, air travel, go back to the airplane analogy, where, where, um, where the monitoring of airplanes all around the world is happening sort of simultaneously. And everybody knows where everybody is and how you can land safely and so on. We already know how to do this um, as a world. 
Uh, the question is, you know, let's, let's, let's actually put our minds together and get it done. It's not going to take actually technological innovation. It's going to take human innovation to actually accomplish it. So that's my, my answer. I think it can be done. I think we're starting to do it. And, you know, it's a matter of our level of passion and commitment uh, to see if we can actually make this happen. And, and I'll add to that. Different patients in different cultural contexts have different needs. In the United States, they want access to their data. They, they, that's, and, but that's very different in other cultural ecosystems. Now, will all, everyone be the same in the end? I don't think so. Uh, but, but it's something that's interesting to ponder, and certainly everyone should have access. Luis, can yeah. I just, just, can I come back to just the previous topic for one second? There was something I thought about just to build on your MSI yeah. high uh, element. We're talking here about uh, harmonization also of, of the regulatory harmonization, how we think about trial harmonization. I think what's also really important about the work that you're doing in MSI High, and it's truly innovative and pioneering, is you're looking at uh, populations that are tumor agnostic. Uh, you have the ability to be able to do. I mean, you're looking at it in GI cancers, but you've got the ability to move from here into a tumor agnostic approach. You are talking about different types of endpoints. You're talking about different ways of approaching in terms of the control arms that you're able to use. The regulatory frameworks are based upon very, very old ways that we used to run our clinical trials. And I think that in order to be able to bring innovations like what you're leading, we've got to have regulatory and trial harmonization moving at the pace that this science is moving at. You talked about the science to medical science to then kind of the clinical delivery. The regulatory framework, I think, is absolutely essential to be building alongside these kinds of innovations. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that every country has a different requirement. And if there can be a harmonization around that, that could be key. So we have time for one more question. Um, otherwise, I'll just answer. Uh, too many lights. Well, thank you. Um, I'm a caregiver to uh, someone <clears throat> who just passed away from lung cancer. Um, and um, I just want to know, the question is really uh, layman. You know, we t talk about lung cancer. China is the ground zero for lung cancer. Um, and talking about global clinical trials really to represent the patient the population that you're trying to treat. And how do you ensure, you know, for all these global clinical trials, let's say just use lung cancer example, to ensure you have the participation, that the Chinese patients would have access to that. And if not, of course, a lot of cultural, financial, and logistic challenges um, you know, aside. And how do you ensure that the golden standards of clinical trials could be carried out in the same way in China? Or making sure if you can't reach the patients there directly, can you have some local program um, that the partnership, the collaboration will really reach um, the patients on the ground in China. And I know this is, you know, it's a multifaceted question and involve a lot of, you know, government policy and all that challenges. But I just wanted to know just from, and part of it is also, I think, maybe the clinical trial design, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. But I know just the, through the care, care given journey, you know, my dad was encountered with a lot of clinical trial, but oftentimes he was ex excluded because of the criteria in the clinical trial design um, that a lot of times he, he cannot participate. So I just wanna, you know, I know, it's, it's kind of just a lot of questions I'm still, as a caregiver, searching for answers. I just wanna know kind of your takes on this. Thank you. You know. <laughs> well, I, let, can I just offer two, two, two starts to this? The first one is I would say that um, on the China-specific element of this, I, I actually think that there's reason for a lot of optimism. I, AstraZeneca in our lung cancer trials has a third of our patients that are participating uh, from China. Uh, Yilong Wu uh, has uh, some of the largest number of participants in lung cancer in clinical trials coming out of China that exist across the globe. So in terms of a, at a, at a global level in terms of your question of is China able to participate in clinical trials, the answer is yes. There's a second part of your question, which is that actually the challenges that you're also asking about aren't uniquely Chinese. Eligibility factors that make it so that lung cancer patients can't participate for reasons that you sometimes don't understand why that is. A lot of that is also because of back to trial harmonization opportunities to say, are these eligibility criteria that we do need to have? 
I think that there's some basic things that are like this that give an opportunity to be able to think about how we expand enrollment. I don't know, Larry, or Isabel. Yeah. Yeah. Isabel, yeah. you go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you're, look, you're asking a critically important question, and I think that that's, that's really, you know, the, 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 the focus of, of our activities here is how to get this accomplished. Um, I think we have to revolutionize clinical trials. I think most of us involved in clinical trials and how we do them. They have to be simpler. Um, uh, they have to involve um, ways of gathering data that, that's easier with patient wearables, for example, um, uh, and the interface of humans and computers is rapidly evolving. We have to take advantage of that, uh, you know, in that particular regard. But we also have to develop drugs that are, that, that are applicable in places in the world where the expenditure, you know, um, you know, you can't even buy one pill with $40 a year. And so I think that, that, um, uh, th that, that, that comes from the science too. I mean, our scientists have to think of ways that that we cannot develop more more difficult to deliver and more expensive, you know, procedures and and, and, and medications. Something CAR T cells, for example, is an example of something that that I can't see that being applicable everywhere. Um, uh, because of the expense of the operation. Um, so that there's a lot to be accomplished. And I go back to the airplane example. It's got to be accomplished by attending to all parts of the process, including regulatory things, things that, that the FDA is requiring that may not be absolutely necessary to make a clinical advance, but is adding to the cost of the trial, adding to the cost uh, to the drug company that's actually doing the trial. Um, so I, I think we have to address it holistically, as, as was mentioned before, with an excellent word, to accomplish this. Um, and that's going to take basically you know, a, a, an international will. Uh, you know, governments will respond to the will of the people for the most part, and I think that, 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 that if, if we make that a focus, let's get better drugs, let's get better approaches, better diagnostics and whatever that's applicable to more people, and let's eliminate all the barriers that are, that are, that, that are uh, preventing us from accomplishing that. I think it can be done. Isabel? I, I really like your question, but it's a topic that was not... Put the mic up. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I really like your question. Uh, um, I think like this harmonization and standardization are top-down approach, which is needed for, for, for quality, but it also is going to generate a massive barrier to low-income countries that don't have the capacity to run this type of clinical trials. There is not the know-how, there is not the infrastructure. So again, I think it could lead to a, a more burden of, of clinical trials targeted to other type of, of, of populations, other ethnicities, geographic uh, locations. So this is something that we need to start taking into account and how we build the local capacity so that the clinical trials also happen in these countries, as also how we bring those countries into these conversations. I think when we're talking about standardizations, low-income countries have to be in the table because if not, we're always going to see it from our, our perspective and then they're not going to have access. I'm not involved in clinical trials, uh, our organization, but we are involved in building local capacity and implementation science and research. And I'm sure it's similar. That when we support locals and, 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 and train them on implementation science, and then we go to grants, you know, you could imagine NCI grants, there's no way they're going to meet it. The, 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 the standards required by the academia are not, it's un, unreachable. So again, there's no, we're not getting grants. And again, I could then hire somebody in high-income countries to meet the grant, but that's not the point. The point is, so how can we simplify? And sometimes I wish it's like, just draft your idea in a paper and send them. And then let's get them to help you on how to build this super duper duper grant proposal that is unbearable. But again, that keeps increasing the, the disparities and the inequities. So I think it's the same. Let's build capacity on clinical research. Let's build capacity on implementation science. And we have a partnership with the Tata Memorial Hospital. They have this credit initiative, and we are supporting a lot of our local stakeholders in building both clinical research capacity, even if it's not our core, and implementation science capacity. Great. Thank you for that question, and condolences to your father. And I know being a caregiver to someone close to you is one of the hardest things you can do. Um, so I want to thank the panelists uh, for their outstanding uh, <laughs> participation. And I want, to, I want to leave you with one thought, which is that, I mean, Bob's done a fantastic job organizing this. And a lot of our mind is on therapeutics. I suspect that in the next iteration of this meeting, we'll be thinking about diagnostics and early detection in ways that we haven't ever thought of them before, because they'll be more powerful than we've ever been able to see them before. So I'll leave you with that, and thank you very much.